Okay, so I'm going to talk about UK Mars a little bit, but mainly the Rotary Encoder project that we've been running. That's Peter Harrison, Stephen Pithouse, and myself, Gary Bulmer. For people who already know a bit about Rotary Encoders, I'm going to give you too long, didn't read. And then for normal people, I'm going to talk about UK Mars and the Mars UK Mars bot, Rotary Encoders, and then mainly DIYing. And we have two interesting things. One is the rotary encoder disk, the magnetic disk, and the other is the electronics. So, too long, didn't read. The purpose of the project is completely replace uh, Pololu ro rotary encoders. These things fit onto the back of 12 millimeter metal gear motors. They have an extra double shaft, a back shaft out of the motor. So, the rep. Magnetic encoders give three to about four and two thirds more resolution than the Pololu, but work with the Pololu encoder, or you could go the whole hog and re replace or not even buy Pololu encoders and use our electronics. Uh, the Rep DIY encoder kit is about 50% of the cost of a Pololu encoder. So your free labor by DIYing it is paying the difference. There's open source PCB CAD. And also, because it's quite hard to make, Stevens designed an encoder disk assembly tool, which I'll show you. Okay, so Dave has already talked about UK Mars, and we have five basic events, a drag race, go as fast as you can, line follow around a circuit, and they use the plug-in line sensor board. And then there are maze events, a wall follower, a time trial, which is around a fixed course, or a maze solver where the course changes for each event. And this into several different categories of person. So the encoder helps on line follower where you can learn the track a bit like a Formula One racing car driver. So you can anticipate how fast you can go down a straight or anticipate a corner. It helps on the time trials for the same reason you can anticipate corners. And it's essential for a maze solver because you're finding a spot and then you have to navigate exactly the same route to get back to the start. So this is the UK Mars bot that David was waving around. Um, and there's quite a lot of information about that. But the thing I'm going to fo focus on is the encoders fitted onto the back of the motors. So I've blown that up a little bit. The yellow oval is the encoder magnetic disk. So it's attached to the motor itself. It spins with the motor exactly the same speed as the motor. And then the yellow rectangle is a printed circuit board and that's soldered straight onto the back of the motor. So these are Pololu or Pololu magnetic rotary encoders here fitted onto 12 millimeter gear motors. Now I'll often say confusing things like encoder disk and what I mean is the magnetic rotary encoder disk and I'll often say encoder PCB and what I mean is the electronics and the PCBs stuck on it. So here's a motor. All of these photographs are on five millimeter paper, squared paper, so you get some idea of size. The wheel sticks on an axle at one end and the back shaft takes the encoder. If we look a little bit more closely at the end of the motor, there's two little metal solder tags sticking out, and that's where we apply power. And then there's a big five millimeter diameter plastic boss, which gets in the way of everything, but effectively is the bearing for that back shaft. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that boss in a second. So when you buy a Pololu kit, you'll get two PCBs with sensor electronics on and two encoder disks that embed magnets. When you try to mount these on the end of a motor, and this is a fairly close picture, that boss gets in the way, and so you end up with a gap. And so one of the requirements that we had for our encoder PCB design is to sit flush on the back of the motor. And that's not just for aesthetic reasons, but it makes it easier for a beginner to solder. So the encoder disk and sensors, each encoder PCB has two Hall effect magnetic sensors, and they're set 90 degrees apart or on a circle. And they have to be 90 degrees apart in order to get the right relationship between the two signals. What we want is the six poles of the magnet, 
with the dairy leaf cheeses in yeah, orange and blue um, to see be seen by sensors in a different state so if one of our sensors is labeled a and the other is labeled b we're looking at different points on a rotary encoder disk these encoder disks have six magnetic poles embedded in them and so each sensor sees six changes we call that six counts per revolution per sensor so with the two sensors we get 12 counts per revolution if you work all of the maths out it means that you get if with the 32 millimeter diameter wheel you get 0.4 millimeter per count so every time the motor moves enough for one of the sensors to detect a change the wheel through a 20 to 1 gearbox will have moved 0.4 of a millimeter roughly and if you're thinking in terms of catching these interrupts it's about um, a seventh of a millisecond so not too fast for something like an arduino which runs at 16 megahertz um, that's oodles of time uh, pete harrison has timed this thing out and he got the code at about four microseconds for an interrupt to work out what's going on so there's quite a lot of time so we don't need to improve that aspect of it very much just get some sense about the scales that we're working with so here's our setup our electronics pcb is exactly the same solder flush to the back of the motor and this is an encoder disk that pete diy'd and the magnets are shoved through those little holes you can see the motor metal gears wheel shaft motion sensor wires so our setup looks pretty much the same except our board is rectangular rectangular and doesn't follow the shape of the motor because it's much cheaper and easier to make rectangular pcbs than pcbs that follow shapes so focusing on the signals there's quadrature signal coming out so each sensor a and b produce a signal as they see magnets flying past i've enhanced this but it's basically an oscilloscope trace and i've put the verticals in to make it easy for you to see what's going on so the top trace a is from one sensor and the bottom trace b is for the from the second sensor on that electronics the key point is that the edges never change at the same time because they're 90 degrees out of phase that will never happen and so you'll see n edges depending on the number of magnets in your encoder disk so for the pololu encoder disk you get 12 counts per revolution now the point about all of this is that if you just counted the edges as you turned your motor you could work out the distance you know ahead of time and can calibrate your gearbox and size of wheel so you know for every little count that happens how far your that wheel has moved now if both of the wheels are moving in lockstep you're going to go in a straight line if the wheels are rotating at the same rate but in opposite directions you're going to rotate on the spot and you can obviously plot out all sorts of more complicated curves so just because one wheel is going at speed a does not mean to say that the other wheel needs to go at the same speed so you can maneuver if you time between two edges and we were talking about 167 microseconds between two edges that gives you an instantaneous speed and that's pretty important if you're trying to uh, accelerate or decelerate in order to adjust for a corner then finally there's a relationship between the a and b signals and that gives us direction and that's the magic of quadrature by having the signals 90 degrees out of phase we can actually work out which way the wheel is spinning the easiest way to think about this is that signals a and b are just each a digit in a two-bit binary number and there are only four possible combinations the trick is for quadrature that you can't get from any state to any state you can only go in a specific sequence so for example if you were in state zero zero that's the top 12 o'clock position and you were going forward you could only see the one zero state 
Similarly, if you did reverse from zero, zero, you could only see zero, one. So if you know your previous state and your current state, you can work out unambiguously which direction the motor is being turned. Now, that might be because you're applying power or maybe you're in a sumo competition and somebody is uh, overpowering you and pushing you off. So we get a lot of information out of encoders. We've got to accept, of course, that there may be a bit of wheel slip. Okay, so that's the basic theory. What have we been doing with ourselves? The rep encoder disk version one is in the picture here. The magnets are quite small. They're one millimeter diameter by one millimeter long. And that particular disk has 14 magnets. They're arranged actually, by that I mean that the magnets are parallel to the back shaft out of the motor. This thing works with the Pololu Hall sensors uh, and gives a high resolution. So in this case, we get 28 counts per revolution of the motor instead of 12. This particular encoder disk has been made out on a CNC machine, routing machine, milling machine, out of MDF. So if we go through all of the numbers again, if that motor was doing 500 revs, 20 to one gearbox on a 32 millimeter wheel, we'll be doing two and a half meters per second. And the resolution of that motion is now better than 0.2 of a millimeter. So that was our first stab. And we did quite a lot of different uh, di dimensional changes on that and different materials. I think we tried about five or six materials. We also uh, came up with via a friend, Jeff, uh, a different strategy, which we call the tangential encoder disk. So instead of the cylindrical magnet going through a circular hole, it actually sits tangential, and I hope you can see the red and blue there, to the circumference. So every magnet is lying in a little grave, if you will, a little cutout, one millimeter square. The beauty of this is that the sensor sees every pole of every magnet. When we were doing the actual arrangement, we could only see with the sensors half of the poles. So now we can see 18 poles and we only need nine magnets. Now that's fabulous from a cost perspective because we've halved the number of magnets that we have to buy and they are the dominant cost. Uh, but we also have to stuff half as many magnets into the thing. Um, and so it makes it much easier and quicker for people to make them. And again, this thing works with the Pololu encoder electronics. So you could do yourself an ice upgrade with nine magnets, a piece of balsa wood laser cut, um, and remove your old Pololu encoder disk and put this new one on instead and get 3x the resolution. As I said, it's quite hard to do this, and we spent a lot of time and effort figuring out ways. And of course, Stephen invented a tool. It's made of a wooden cocktail stick with the point cut off. What you do is you glue one of these one millimeter cylindrical magnets on the end. And if you notice the orientation is um, left to right rather than along the length of the cocktail stick. So you super glue it on and then you heat shrink plastic tube. The beauty of this is that when you pick up one of these tiny magnets, it guarantees the orientation of the loose magnet that you're about to stuff into your encoder disk. And so you can do it much faster. And if you put an index mark on the side to make sure you're always holding it the right way around, you're guaranteed that as you stuff the magnets, they're all in the correct orientation. So this has gone from something that we were thinking of a fabulously complex uh, jig and solution to something that's very straightforward to do. Uh, Stephen can make one of these encoder disks in less than two minutes. Okay, so now let's move on to our electronics. The magnetic sensor PCB you can see in this picture, it actually has one of the older actual encoder disks. This was made by Peter. Um, the PCB is about 13 millimeters wide and 16 millimeters high. And on the bottom photograph, hopefully you can just see that the encoder disk is sitting on the back shaft of the motor. And the PCB is actually sitting flat against the motor. It fits around the motor boss. 
as I said earlier, it's about 50% of the cost of a Pololu encoder. And it's 1206 parts because that's what local school children have been using for years uh, in Coventry. They get much better success making electronics using surface mount technology than through hole with soldering irons. So we have high hopes that education makers, hobbyists can make these things with a bit of practice. Uh, we wouldn't suggest this is the very first thing you make as a surface mount project, but certainly second or third. Now, the magic source that makes all of this much easier than it first appeared is a sensor. Uh, one of our colleagues, Derek Hall, puts us on this track, made by Allegro Micro. It's called the stunningly attractive APS-12626. It's a package that has two Hall sensors inside. But unusually, it's not two Hall sensors lying on their back next to each other. They're orientated on different axes. They're orthogonal on an X, Y, or Z axis. So you can buy sensor packages with any two axes. The blow up shows Z pointing out of the top of the package, and X and Y, X is looking down and Y is looking to the right. So if you imagine lying on the floor looking up at the ceiling and you see a magnet passing across before your eyes and you see a north pole you'll flip in one direction and then later you'll see a south pole and you z will flip in another direction however if you were x looking towards the bottom of the page you would see in the distance this magnetic pole appearing and when you see it well enough you'll see that it's a north and you'll flip in one direction and then when you see the south of pole approaching you'll flip in the other state so you still get quadrature output on a and b just as if you had two separate sensors and the genius of this particular chip is it's almost immune to the pitch of the magnets on the encoder disk so 9 and 14 or 10 or whatever number you want will work we've been using 9 and 14 9 gives us a 36 count and 14 gives us a 56 count you could just as easily use 10 the other marvelous thing that allegra micro have done on our behalf is they've done a very similar chip but instead of producing two quadrature outputs it produces on the a output speed so we get exactly all of the edges that we would get as if we xored the two signals together and on b we get direction and this hardly changes from millisecond to millisecond. This only changes when the motor actually spins in a different direction. So if you're using a microcontroller that doesn't have fancy electronic timers or counters that could track a quadrature signal, this is much simpler and it actually makes the interrupt service routine code uh, shorter and quicker. So the APS 1265 is quite a marvelous chip. We haven't assembled any of the PCBs with that on, but the PCBs will take it and will work the right way around if you, if you understand what I mean. So the electronics is fairly simple. It's two completely separate circuits on the same printed circuit board. The top is the dual hall sensor, and that's the four parts on the right-hand side printed circuit board. And at the bottom of the schematic is the gear motor. And the gear motor, solders directly into the bcb the big plastic boss sticks through the big hole and it's got one capacitor on it to reduce the um, electromagnetic interference generated by the motor so this pcb is about 13 millimeters wide 16 millimeters tall and i've designed it using eagle 7.6 and for those people who are into open source and eagle they'll know that that's a fairly useful one because it's free uh, and not encumbered by any AutoCAD license. Now, we're not going to make just one of these PCBs. It's far too expensive. Eagle uh, allows us to deal with a 100 by 80 millimeter PCB panel, and these 1206 size part uh, PCBs are 13 by 16 right now. I'm going to increase to 13 by 18 millimeters to improve usability. Um, but I can still get 30 PCBs on a panel 
And the PCBs are either separated by V cuts, which is a kind of fine milled scribed line, or two millimeter wide slots. So out of five panels, you can get 150 encoder PCBs. So if you're in education um, or a maker space, uh, one order will get you enough PCBs to keep you happy for quite a long time. In theory, that's 70 robots worth. I mean, obviously you make a few mistakes, but they're so cheap that you might actually just use them as nice connectors for your motors. So we've been doing testing. All of the initial testing was using the Pololu encoder PCB. So we did nine and 14 magnets, actual and tangential, which gave us double resolution, and they worked fine. So if you want to take your existing Pololu encoders and just get a bit more resolution out of them, you could DIY yourself some encoder disks. Our electronics has had less testing, uh, only got the boards right quite recently. We've tested with nine magnet tangential, 36 counts per rev, and 14 magnet actual, axial, 28 counts per rev, and it so far is working fine. So it looks like we can generalize this um, with different variations of encoder disk. Now, of course, part of the point about having open source CAD is you might want to change some of the orientation to fit onto a different motor, you know, knock yourselves out. An obvious question is, does all of this extra resolution give you anything? And so Stephen did some tests with his motor control software. Normally, if you apply PWM to a motor that's fairly cheap like these things, they might not be an absolutely consistent speed as they rotate. Uh, Stephen's software was able to maintain a consistent set point, a consistent speed at any value. And so that extra 3x uh, resolution, excuse me a second. <clears throat> Sorry for that. The extra resolution is useful and you can actually get not only finer position control, but also fine speed control. We still need more testing, so we need help if people want to volunteer. We want to check more motors to make sure that the physical fit of the PCBs just goes on without any fettling or rework. Um, experiments in making more disks, stuffing more magnets, and so on. So like everything, these things need testing. So just to give you an insight into the approximate costs, the encoder disks, 10 off for about 70p. The electronics, uh, PCB and electronics are about less than one pound 30. Uh, and you need to use your own favorite SMD assembly technique. The assembly tool costs about 20p in parts. Right, so what do we want to do next? Um, we have some blogs already on ukmars.org about making actual encoder disks. I need to release onto my GitHub the CAD and hopefully this will eventually go onto the UK Mars GitHub. Um, part of that CAD is panelized CAD and CAM, so you don't actually need to know how to use Eagle. You just need to upload a zip file to your manufacturer. And I need to write a blog about how I panelized all of this, which is the main learning point, and some of the electronics. I'm also going to revise the electronics. Stephen did some naive assembly tests with a friend and identified some things which we think we can fix um, and make it even more uh, naive user friendly. And finally, here's some useful links for you to look at. I'll put the paper PDF uh, on my blog at arduino.wordpress.com. Okay. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, so we've got a few questions, if that's okay. Fabulous. Okay, so on the, magic, on the magnetic, I don't know when this was asked, so... On the magnetic sensors, you have them at 90 degrees apart. Would you be On the Pololu uh, encoder, yes. Would you be able to tell more about the spin direction if one was offset <clears throat> doesn't trigger the north-south pole at the exact same time as the other sensor? So the one of the slides was a funny little picture which attempted to suggest that the, the, the real point of what's going on is... 
if one sensor is seeing full in the face a pole, the other sensor is teetering on the brink of going from a north to a south. So they're never seeing the same thing. And that's what the 90 degree degrees does. So if you skewed away from that 90 degrees, the shape of your pulse would deteriorate. And if you went really crazy, for example, put them at 180 degrees, they would be seeing pretty much um, the reverse uh, of the same thing at the same time. So their edge transitions would be completely muddled and muddy. Right. Okay. So um, I, I think that answers the question about the angles. Yep. Have you had any issues with the magnets slipping or spinning on the motor shaft if the motor is rapidly changing direction? Um, well, very good question. We've tried a bunch of different materials. We've tried acrylic, MDF, um, the sort of di display board people stick photographs to, uh, balsa wood. And balsa wood and foam core display board work fine. They have uh, an undersized hole, so it's the push fit onto the back shaft of the motor, and I'm that's enough for friction. You right. could, I guess, put a little tiny bit of uh, soft cement on or something, but we haven't had uh, huge problems about that. And the other beauty of having the thing be a very slightly soft material is that you can push the magnets in, and they'll bind a little bit into the hole, and then we've been using um, very very liquid super glue to harden uh, the encoded disc before you stuff it so you can take a piece of balsa wood soak it in super glue and it becomes a much tougher material right um next question do you have difficulty sensing poles if the motor is running at, for instance 1000 rpm no Stephen uh, actually did some quite extensive um <laughs> very extensive tests running at lots and lots of different speeds shuttling back and forth and so on um, and certainly uh, for the top speed of the motors that we're using which is about 500 rps um, using uh, i think stephen was using a 36 count per rev so that's 18 18 kilohertz um no that's not wasn't a problem oh. um, and that's against software uh, interrupts. If you were using some of the fancier microcontrollers, like we use STM32 a lot, and those have timers that can actually decode quadrature in hardware, so those things ain't going to lose anything. Um, yeah. And so you can fairly accurately time things or keep track of things. Um, one from Brian. Have you found any commercial supplier of the actual discs? He knows that Pololu sell theirs, but they haven't managed to find any other suppliers on AliExpress or anything. Oh, you can buy the Pololu encoder discs from a company in Birmingham. Uh, and the last time I looked, um, I can stick it on my uh, Arduino WordPress blog if that helps. Yeah. But they were selling them for about uh, 56p each. However, postage, packing, handling, and VAT uh, didn't get you back down to 70 pence until you were buying 50s-ish, I think. Right. Uh, but you can buy exactly the same Pololu magnetic encoder disc. Um, it's sold as a Pololu part from a company in Birmingham. Oh, um, right. So if, yeah, okay. I, I spent ages trying to find them, and then I just discovered that it was about <laughs> 400 yards from my old office. <laughs> well, I but think yes, I, I'll put the name on. I'll put the name on my blog. Okay, cool. Me. Could you um put the address of your blog onto the stage chat or something, and um when you get a minute, and um people will be able to find it. Oh yes. Oh, how do I put? Uh, well, I'll just oh, type it now. Yeah. Afterwards, yeah, or whatever. Um, it's just our Duino. Our Duino. Okay, cool. Um, I think that is all the questions we've got. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's all the questions we've got. So thank you so much for that really interesting talk. I, I followed about half of it, but I'm not, I'm not a maths person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I wrote all the maths down for those people who like to look at that stuff, but they only, yeah. it's only really for a PDF, to be fair. 